It's my great honor to introduce Andy Carvin. Andy Carvin is a senior strategist at NPR. Andy is also a recent winner of the Knight Batten Award uh, for the work that he's been doing this year. Uh, I think he's just finished his last tweet, so he's probably ready to go. <laughs> for the last year, Andy has been tweeting and posting nonstop covering the Arab Spring that has now evolved into what is now the Arab Awakening. Uh, in the process, I believe he's really created a new paradigm of news coverage and news reporting using social media. It's, uh, it's extraordinary what's taken place in the last year. But obviously, Andy wasn't alone, and he was a long way from Tahrir Square and uh, the rest of the Arab world. To get the message out, he needed to make the world aware of the revolutionary, revolutionary changes going on uh, of the brave women and young men who shared their on-the-ground reporting and first-hand experience with the world via Facebook and Twitter. Andy would say he was merely the conduit of these brave individuals. Today, Andy is joined by three of those people who share their stories with the world. All the way down, uh, well, let's see, we'll start with Rahab. Rahab uh, El Bakri is the former deputy editor in chief of Egypt Today magazine who now blogs for Cairo. The name of her blog is The Media Chicky, And I'm sure we'll get to the bottom of why that's the case. Uh, next over is Isander El Amrani, uh, who works from Cairo. Isander is a freelance journalist and commentator. He publishes one of the longest running blogs in the Middle East, The Arabist. It's a blog that focuses on Arab politics and culture. And all the way down at the end, and rounding out our panel is Nasser Wadadi, who's actually Boston-based. He's a Mauritanian human rights activist who's been actively involved in tweeting the Arab Spring during the, since the early days of Tunisia. He's a member of the American Islamic Congress, and really for the last decade, he's been building up a network of contacts and connections in the Arab world that sort of laid the, a lot of the foundation of what was going on uh, this past year. Moderating our panel is Jennifer Preston from the New York Times. Welcome, Jennifer. Jennifer covers the intersection of social media, politics, government, business, and real life. And uh, what could be more real than the past events of this past year in the Arab world? Jennifer. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. So we don't have um, a lot of time, so we're going to get right to a few questions and then your questions and we're also taking questions on Twitter so please use the hashtag spring key for your questions on uh, Twitter um, so the first thing we'd like to do is to set the table here and uh, everyone I think here knows what, what Andy was, was doing in January, and that is telling so many of us um, what was happening on the ground in uh, first Tunisia and then Egypt from um, Washington. But why don't you, if you could please just tell us what is happening now in the Middle East and what are you seeing and what's well, in your it's, stream? It, it's a big mess. It's a really confusing situation right now because it's, it's very easy for people who have watched the Arab Spring play out, treating it as a romantic narrative where people rise up, a dictator falls, and everyone celebrates and goes about their business. But it's, it's not that simple. Uh, Tunisia and, and uh, Egypt are both struggling to figure out how to get to that next step of, of governance and democracy. And uh, there are lots of internal domestic debates coming from every conceivable corner. Uh, in Libya, you know, how many, how many of us would have actually predicted that their revolution would have essentially succeeded and so they, now they have the, the need to actually build a real civil society for the first time in several generations. Yemen is suddenly back on the map. Syria, we don't know where it's going. Bahrain had protests today. And so just when you think you know what's going on in one place or another, you realize you don't. Because in some ways, the Arab, calling it the Arab Spring or the Arab Awakening, it's, it's an easy catchphrase, but what you're really seeing here is each country has such complex dynamics of their own. Occasionally, they raise up to a level where you can, you know, you can feel the trajectory of everything moving in one direction. But ultimately, it's a lot of different conflicts, and I don't necessarily mean violent conflicts. That is the case sometimes, but conflicts of, of, of politics and religion and everything else in between. And so, it's it, it's a hot mess right now. And, and we'll get back to this question, but I think one question that many of us have is that early on when you were curating the conversation, it was kind of easy to tell 
who is the bad guy, who is the good guy. The bad guys, they were on horses. Um, but of course, the story is much more complicated. So we'll get back to that about like how you sort that out. Now, Rahab, you were there in, in Cairo on January 25th. In your profile, you have core journalists. So tell us, what, where is a core journalist heart and mind and, and spirit and when you're right there in the middle of a revolution? How, do you, how, did, you, how did you draw that line? Um, oh well, the line was so blurred at that point, I couldn't find it. Um, I've always valued the idea of being removed from the story. I think that the moment you, you overstep your boundaries, you're, it, it's fine, but don't call yourself a journalist. I've never been in a situation where what rested on the other side of that day or on the other side of that week, month, year, would something that would profoundly impact not just me, but my country, hopefully my kids and their kids, and, you know, give freedom to a lot of people who have never known it. And at that point, I think I weighed my journalistic values on one side and my country on the other. And quite frankly, I'm okay with the decision that I made. I probably overstepped my bounds. I became part of the story in a lot of ways. Um, and I have no regrets. But I'm still a core journalist. And I still believe in the values of journalism and, and what they represent. But at the same time, yeah, my country, my future, my, my people's future, much more important. Thank you. So, we saw the major role that cell phones, that Facebook, that Twitter, that Al Jazeera, there were so many, of course, pieces and, and, and parts that brought uh, the people to the square in, in January. What role do you think that social media can and will play as Egypt tries to build a government? Well, I think it's going to go back to the situation probably, uh, at least as far as Egypt is concerned, certainly Tunisia, perhaps also other countries, the way it was in the few months before. We have to remember that, for instance, the Egyptian protests were organized on Facebook. Facebook provided a convenient and safe and fast way to uh, organize, to spread certain ideas to, uh, for people who, especially at the time under the Mubarak regime, when technically under the emergency law that was in place then, still is in place now, uh, you can't have meetings of more than five people without police permission. Uh, um, you know, rarely enforced, but it's always there hanging over your head. Um, it helped people kind of gather in virtual meeting rooms and exchange ideas. And this was a long process. It didn't start a month or two before uh, uh, the, the uprising. It started uh, uh, in the case of the, the two main Facebook groups, one a year before, the other actually probably in 2006. <laughs> And they form communities, communities of people who, for whom going out and protesting on the streets was the, either some, not something they were used to, they were not activists at university and so on, they weren't in those circles, or they were scared, scared for their jobs, because many people in the last few years lost their jobs for taking a stand on their blogs, on, uh, on, on Twitter, in, in, um, or just you know, joining political movements. Uh, because immediately then your boss will get a visit from state security and say, you know, this guy is a troublemaker, are you sure? You know, it's not going to be very good for your company, you're going to have problems. Uh, so uh, uh, that's what Facebook provided. And, I, and I, 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 I'm of the school that doesn't think that in Egypt, you know, in, in the moment of the uprising, when, when, when everything was up in the air in those 18 days, I don't think it was necessarily at its most important then. It was more important uh, 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 before. Which Especially because for three, three, four days, Facebook there were, there was no internet in Egypt. Yeah. So, so people weren't using Facebook, and perhaps that was a good thing, is that they, they left their computer and went onto the street. Now, tell me, you grew up in Syria, Libya, we have seen, of course, the tumult across the, the region, and there's been a lot of concerns about the negative role that social media has played in Syria with the government, you know, going to activists and threatening them with um, jail and worse if they don't turn over Facebook uh, uh, passwords. What other um, ways do you think that that social media 
Facebook is presenting dangerous situations for activists now across the region? First of all, the, uh, um, I think that the primary example of the bad use of social media would be Bahrain. Yes. Uh, that tiny, pesky little uh, sheikdom in the midst of the Gulf. Um, as repressive as they can be and as um, uh, polished as can be by uh, foreign PR firms and with Saudi support. Because in Bahrain really you saw the emergence of this very quickly of uh, legions of uh, Twitter users, we used to call them the eggs because they, they didn't have uh, <laughs> profile pictures, had very little followers count. And uh, they were basically the, the, the other side uh, of the uh, information warfare because uh, let's not kid ourselves here. All these romanticizing of Facebook and Twitter came by because there was a need to uh, bypass sort of the dictatorships uh, hold on the information in, these, uh, in that area of the world. And also for those of us who have been in the trenches for, for the better part of the last two decades trying to get our voices heard only to be blocked by editorial uh, blocks or frankly narratives about the region that did not factor in uh, the, the other and I call the bigger most important conflict which is the conflict between uh, the people of the region and the, uh, and the ruling dictatorships. Now in the specific uh, negative uh, use of, uh, um, of uh, social media in terms of the platforms, uh, Facebook, etc. Um, the Syrians didn't really invent anything. The Egyptians tried that uh, um, in, in the last four years. There have been uh, arrests of, uh, um, arrests of uh, activists and dissidents who were basically, they would beat out the password out of them, which at times would render technologies, so-called liberation technologies, useless. Like you can encrypt all you want, but if you're beaten and tortured, you will have to give your password. But there's been also a cat and mouse game that's been going on for the better part of the last decade, interestingly pioneered by the Tunisians, who were the most sophisticated uh, <laughs> cyber activists in the Arab world, not only in the use of platforms, I mean, a lot of people would credit um, folks like Sami bin Garbiya of the Nawat joint, uh, Malik, uh, Astrobal and that crowd, uh, with sort of, again, with the help with a whole collective of other Arab activists, of uh, developing uh, what we call cross-posting for advocacy, which is very much what you saw, um, uh, what you saw uh, in the last year, where information was taken, recontextualized, packaged uh, in a way where you get the maximum uh, out of one click, what, what w would have taken you a decade ago, 15 clicks to get to, was packed to you in Twitter, in one click on a link. And that's very much was, uh, was, was the culmination of the use of these technologies. Yes, there are negative sides by having dictatorships, uh, like the Tunisians, by the way, who, again, in that cat, cat and mouse game, they were harvesting. Uh, harvesting password. passwords, yes. Yes, and phishing, and, yes. and, and, uh, and, 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 and frankly, their, their, their operation uh, uh, censoring the internet uh, was basically the most sophisticated in the Arab world, no doubt. But there's another, Sort of on a quirky side of things, I was meeting with uh, the new head of the internet, uh, Tunisian Internet Authority the, uh, the other day, Shakshuk, and he said that uh, the by, the, there's a byproduct of the lifting of the uh, censorship in Tunisia, which was that now the, uh, the bandwidth is so low that you can't stream those videos that people thought <laughs> to have <laughs> the freedom to see. And those are some of the li interesting limitations you see there. Now, getting back, Andy, to what we were discussing about the story is so much more complicated now. So how do you sort all of that out in real time? You know, it's going to vary by country to country. So with uh, the 18 days of the Egyptian revolution in Tunisia before that, what you saw through social media was very one-sided. You didn't see the regimes creating accounts or using accounts that already existed to you know, support their side. Instead, you saw this massive wave of protesters organizing and mobilizing and, and in many cases acting as citizen journalists, capturing footage of what was taking place within the protests, which made for an interesting dilemma because in both countries, some of my best sources were also some of the most active in the revolutions. And so on the one hand, the videos and the photos that they would send me were absolutely invaluable. They, they were often better than anything the media could get. But when they would write things about what was going on, you sometimes had to take out some of it with a grain 
an assault. Like, uh, there'd be times where they would claim, you know, 500,000 people are at this particular protest when in reality maybe it's 15 or 20. Now, 15 or 20,000 is still impressive, but when you're trying to mobilize more people to get out, half a million sounds better. And so, uh, if, if you're just following one or two activists, you, you have to remember the role they're playing themselves. Having said all that, if you're following 20 or 30 of activists in a particular place like Tahrir Square, uh, and they're all tweeting things that seem similar and there's a lot of chaos going on, there's a good chance that what they're talking about is basically true. You just have to, you have to sort it out. It's, a, it's almost like a form of situational awareness where you're floating a, above Tahrir in a, in a helicopter or something. You may not know every single detail, but you can see things coming together from all these different perspective. And you experienced that yourself. We were chatting earlier. You were in Cairo in June and you were at the edge of a large gathering. But, yeah. but So tell us a little bit about that. Like yeah. how you sorted out what was going on. So on June 28th there was one of the largest protests that had happened in months and it happened. It, it spiraled out of control very quickly. And uh, I was actually meeting with a group of protesters and we, we heard tear gas in the distance going off and everyone pulled out their phones to look at Twitter and in five minutes everyone was gone to take part in whatever way they chose. And so I went with a small group to figure out a way to observe in a place that I wouldn't really get in the way. And somehow we found ourselves, you know, kind of going after we got through all the tear gas that we were then in between police lines. So in front of us there were a group of riot police facing away from us and rocks from the protesters flying towards us. And on the other side were more riot police ready to get into action. And so we had to play dumb and like not take our cameras out and just had to observe things and not take any chances. And then when the police were busy we got the hell out of there. But in the entire you know, 30 minutes or whatever it was that we were stuck in that position, I could hear it, I could see it, I could taste it, I could feel it, I could smell it. You know, it was all around me, but I had no idea what was going on. Tahrir Square was 75, 100 feet straight ahead of me, but because of the police lines and all the smoke and all the tear gas, I had no idea what was going on. And it wasn't until I was able to, we got back in a car and I was able to pull up my phone and look at it, that suddenly the whole thing fell into view for me. Because of who because, you were following Because of on the big Twitter. picture, because yeah. of all the people that mm -hmm. I were following that were in the midst of the melees. Mm -hmm. I think we, we have to realize that the big picture of what happened during those 18 days is still coming out. I mean, partly is we, we have the side, we, we have to a large degree the, the, the side of the activists because they've spoken out a lot and there's a lot, they've uploaded a lot of videos. But there's a lot of content out there. There's a lot of testimonies, a lot of different versions of what happens. It's going, it's going to take painstaking work to, to, to reconcile. What we still don't have, and we're only barely starting to get, is the regime side. What happened? What decisions were made? You know, the decision to pull out the police towards the end of the day uh, in, uh, on, on 28th of January, when, where the police were basically defeated, with the, uh, uh, with the conversations between President Mubarak and his interior minister, Habibul Adli, which are now the subject of, of his, the, the Mubarak court case and, and the Adli court case. Uh, all of this stuff, you know, is, is coming up. We still have a very partial picture and Partly because these, these uprisings were experienced by journalists and by the world through social media, which has that kind of immediacy and emo emotional charge. Uh, and partly because for the mainstream, let's say the TV stations, especially all the TV stations, whether it's Arabic ones like Jazeera or uh, uh, foreign ones like uh, uh, CNN, let's say, they wanted those spectacular images, those inspiring images. They didn't, you know, they didn't have the access to get what was happening on the government side, to know to know what was happening there. They couldn't be everywhere at once. It was uh, it was dangerous. The you know we we, we got the, the big anchormen come out and they wanted to be at certain key symbolic locations. It's not until much later that you get really uh, 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 the greater picture. Um, I know just, you know, as a, uh, 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 as, a, as a journalist, you know, we were trying to get what we could. I mean, this is, I think at the end of the day, we were either trying to confirm what we were hearing on Twitter when we had access to it, uh, 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 or we were just trying to do our standard job of, of, of reporting what we saw. And uh, you would get a lot of contra contra contradictory input. You could get a lot of stuff that you couldn't run with. I was getting calls about bodies being dumped on the street by, by, by police. I, I didn't, and sometimes there were places that I couldn't go and verify because it was dangerous. 
uh, th this is the kind of thing that, that unfortunately, I think, and it's one of the sad things about the way the transition hasn't gone so well uh, in Egypt, is that there, there hasn't been a serious effort yet to really uh, uh, get all that testimony by the, you know, by the Egyptian state, or even, or even frankly, you know, non-state actors, uh, to, to, to try and document some of the things uh, that have happened. And it's one of the sources of frustration, especially for the families of uh, the 80, 850 plus people who died. And I don't think it's going to happen. It may very well not happen, or, or at least happen. when it happens, it's going to happen. I, I, I mean, I think there are, there is a project underway, for instance, to already record an oral history while people. People's memories are still fresh. And it will be know, so interesting to see uh, all of the data. And I'm speaking to a room full of uh, lots of people who know how to sift through that to mm -hmm. tell the story, perhaps through so many of the accounts you know that that were shared on social media and um, and bamboozer. Mm -hmm. Bamboozer, that incredible, was like, what is Bamboozer? It was just like this amazing uh, photo mobile sharing site. Um, we want to get to your questions in just, uh, in, in just a minute. So, uh, so please uh, think about what you would like to ask um, our panelists. And we'll also um, hopefully take some questions from, from Twitter. Um, so, so actually, let me. I, I have a. Do you want to jump in? I, I was. Gonna, I was going to follow up on what Asandra was saying about the the media and whether um, the media in Egypt, for example, or in yes. the rest of the Arab world, for that matter, will actually take the trouble to actually tell you the stories because a lot of these stories may or may not come out in courtrooms, but the way stories are told are by journalists and that's why we exist. However, if you look at Arab media and its history over the past 50, 60 years, Arab media has been notoriously censored. Um, and Egypt is a, a leading example uh, of that. We had a censor sitting on the editorial board of every single newspaper. And how has that changed? That was a fascinating wasn't. conversation. We were, you're not supposed to have fascinating conversations right before a panel. So we're going to share this one with you. We were having this fascinating conversation about your view and your perceptions about how the media um, has changed or not in the last eight, eight months. So, so where where, where, I don't think where are folks has. now? I don't think it has. I think one of the funnest things to do was on the day of the 10th of January, reading the government newspapers. Government newspapers are, you know, pro-government. They pay your salary, you write what they tell you. So as far as they're concerned, everybody that was protesting, they were drug dealers, they were, you know, people of ill repute. Uh, you know, Tahrir Square was nothing but a big sexual gathering area. Um, and then, you know, you have all of these headlines plastered all over the place, and then the next morning it's, the public has toppled the government. And I'm like, the public has toppled the government? And then you read on it, and it's like, the great people of Egypt have done this, 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 and that. I'm like, where were you for the past 10 days? I thought we were all bastards yesterday. Um, and it, it will continue, and until today, the switch, um, national TV, for example, which has the, the largest reach in Egypt, they were reporting on another revolution in another country, for, for God's sake. They used to say that in Tahrir Square, at the time when there were millions of people there, they were saying that there were like a few hundred people. And then the, ne the next day, you know, suddenly we were, we were going to be about freedom and democracy and the, great, you know, the, the greatest moment in modern Egyptian history. I'm like, what are you talking about? They basically, they write what they're told. And it's amazingly hilarious. So that has not changed and it won't. In, in, in your view. Uh, and it you, won't. And you don't think it will? I don't think it will because you're talking about an entire, you know, six or seven generations of journalists who have no idea what objective journalism is. They don't know what it is. Um, they write whatever they're told to write, depending on who owns the newspaper or the magazine or the satellite channel or whatever that they work for. And they know that if they write something against the policies, the editorial policies of that organization, they're going to lose their job, they're going to lose their bonus, they're not going to get promoted. Um, 
So they don't know how to do that, and you're trying to teach them from scratch. A few years ago, I used to deliver a training course about for, for, for young journalists how to cover development issues. And I was teaching them about modern feature writing and statistics and things like that. And one of the young journalists went to her editor with a wonderful feature. She wrote about one of the poorest neighborhoods in Cairo, and she got a letter of reprimand because she did interviews. We only interview officials. Well, that's also, you know, the word blogger. The word blogger. What does the word blogger in Egypt mean? I, I honestly, I think when I look at the bloggers in many parts of the Middle East and North Africa, they would be Pulitzer Prize winning journalists in this country. So, so it'll be interesting just to see if the role and definition of the blogger um, um, changes with, 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 if I may just interject in defense of uh, our Egyptian colleagues, I, 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 I think, well, just, just in my experience and the people that I know who work the various papers, it, it, it's a constant fight. You have factions within papers. Some of them want to do good work, want to, want to tell the truth. Uh, their editors are either, you know, uh, 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 extremely afraid to push the envelope or they're receiving instructions from the owner. But it's a constant fight. And this fight is going to play out, I think, in the Egyptian media and other media uh, in the region uh, for a while. It's the, you know, I, 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 don't th I don't think it's quite fair to say that everyone is, is a complete uh, uh, you know, uh, doormat. Um, but but, but uh, and that's an interesting thing that's going to happen. And just on the question you raised of bloggers, it's already been a few years that bloggers by the more courageous uh, Egyptian newspapers, like uh, uh, this one newspaper called The Store, run by a quite prominent firebrand uh, editor who's gotten into a, a lot of trouble with the regime in the past, was one of the first to hire the bloggers because he recognized, I think, Ibrahim Mesa, this editor, recognized the value of having those voices and, and, and the that value of their difference with, yes. with the, you know, the, the, the monolithic state-run media and, and the type of journalism it produced for uh, decades now in Egypt. And you're one of the few uh, on, on the blogger front, very briefly, uh, protected I'll, from not being in the Arab Egypt. Bloggers Conference in 2009, which now apparently is the work of legend, uh, one of the biggest debates was uh, um, the bloggers, what are we? And of course there's a wide consensus, please do not stick on us any political labels. We're bloggers, we pass information, and of course when challenged, I was the one who pushed us, so that makes you an activist. Mm, the, 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 there was a pause, they like, I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> the lines will remain blurred, I guess, for, uh, for some also, time. Also, really, so uh, I think also bloggers in, in the Middle East are like bloggers in America. Most of them are teenagers who write about their who have you know, teenage <laughs> angst. A few, only a few of them are the ones writing about economics, politics, and so on. <laughs> so why don't we take a question um, from Twitter? Oh, here's Elizabeth. And, uh, and who would like to ask the first question in the audience? Um, there are, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, there are actually um, several questions about uh, verifying sources, so I'm just going to um, ask one of them uh, on behalf of all of them. Um, question, how do you verify tweets? Uh, what to trust? Any mistakes, regrets? Um, how can what you do scale? That's the topic of an entire conference, practically. Um, it, for myself, at least, um, I, I see my Twitter feed as essentially an open source newsroom. Uh, I, the stuff I tweet, uh, a lot of it isn't verified, but that's why I'm tweeting it, because I know for a fact I have a lot of subject matter experts and eyewitnesses following my Twitter account. And so when I post these things, I often do it with the word source question mark or confirmed question mark and then whatever it happens to be. And then we try to hash it out. So in the early days of the uh, Libyan revolution, when there was no Western press in there and videos were suddenly coming out seeming to show uh, uh, protests happening there, some people didn't think this was actually Libya. It had to be somewhere else. So uh, so I would post the videos and people would come out of the woodwork on my Twitter account and say I recognize the accent. That sounds like Benghazi or somewhere in the east of Libya. And I recognize that spot on the Corniche. It has to be Benghazi. And people would debate back and forth. And But the fact that people were recognizing things that I wasn't fishing for specifically started mm -hmm. helping me identify not only 
which of these videos might be real, but who are the Twitter followers out there who might be able to help me in other circumstances? The other thing I've also tried to do is when I've uh, started working on a particular country, ideally I try to start with people I already know. So in the case of Tunisia, in the case of Egypt, there were three or four people on the ground that I had been following for years, some of whom I had met in person on several occasions. So I started observing who they were tweeting and who they were retweeting. And so uh, when, when they retweet certain people more than others or at reply them a lot, when they at reply apply them with the language informal? Did they use emoticons when talking to each other to suggest a relationship there? And so over time I got a sense of who their social networks were, uh, you know, in the old sense of the word. And so uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that each thing that they're going to say when they're in Tucker Square or wherever is absolutely true, but it's what they're experiencing at the moment. And so collectively there is something in there that needs to be hashed out. And so by sharing it across my Twitter feed, I hope to figure it out whether it's full-blown journalism or formal oral history or somewhere in between, that, I don't worry about that too much because I just know these are the things that these folks are experiencing right now, so let's try to sort it out. But it all begins, of course, with who you follow, right. and that was, and that was of, of course, the most important thing that, that, that you did. Now, do we have questions from the audience? If you could wave your arms wildly. Or send smart signals. Okay, because I can't see. Oh, here we go. Hello, I'm Tarek Basley. I work for Al Jazeera English. Um, like uh, yourselves, I've spent the last year or so curating a lot of the um, YouTube video that's come online, available to everybody, but it takes quite a lot of unpackaging to make sense of and try and verify. Um, it strikes me that initially a lot of news um, agencies, particularly television companies, were very reluctant to use this material for the very reason it couldn't be 100% verified. Uh, the position we took, and I certainly took, was that we couldn't ignore this material. Um, it was some of the worst video I've ever seen in my life, and I've spent a decade looking at war material. Um, the, some of the stuff coming out of Syria still haunts me, and it's not stopping. It's, a, it's an avalanche of material. Um, I guess my appeal is that Perhaps m mainstream media should be a little more adventurous. Should couch this material by saying it cannot be justified, it cannot be verified, but it appears to be this. It conforms with other reports that we're getting. That could be Twitter reports, it could be um, other media reports. But have a look and decide for yourself as a viewer, because there's an awful lot of material out there, an awful lot of stories that I still think aren't being told because of that old school reluctance, that reluctance to use this material because it's not 100% verified. Perhaps you have comments on that. Sure. Um, in terms of again, uh, without sounding, making, uh, wanting to sound, the, uh, making this to look like a mannequin battle between the, the blog, the activist and uh, media organization. Here's the reality. Uh, prior to January 14th, um, with the exception of Al Jazeera, France, uh, France 24, and maybe BBC English, no one wanted the story. Because first of all, Tunisia didn't even register on the map. And there's this turning moment, probably you remember this, uh, um, uh, Andy, that video from Gasserine in the hospital. I do. And uh, I'm correlating two points, uh, pointers here just to, 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 make, uh, to make the point. As Tunisia was blowing up, um, a friend of mine and myself uh, penned an op-ed and sent it to a widely circulated American, uh, highly respected newspaper. They, the response was, our readers are not interested in Tunisia. And my point is, is that our job as social media acti uh, activists was to force that video on the news cycle and force people to recognize that this is news. Because before that, it was not news. And for, 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 for a multitude of reasons. But I'm glad to say that since, it's quite clear now, that since the uprising started, uh, most mainstream media organizations started recognizing the value of, uh, of these videos because it was proven that you cannot 
report news without plugging into these new avenues, sources of information. Now they cannot, maybe they're not always verifiable, and even in some instances they, they, they were deliberately, uh, um, uh, people would play some videos just to discredit one journalist or, or a, a, a news source, but you cannot today report news without looking at what is happening on the social networks. It's just impossible. If, if let me just interject here. This is why I started blogging. I said, I, I would, I've been a freelance journalist based in uh, uh, Egypt for a long time. I was working with local English language publications, but then I stopped and I started to blog. Why? Because frankly, most of the papers that I, and big papers, newspapers in, in the US and the UK, uh, when I was doing more kind of hard news type of reporting, were not interested in the stories. And you know, in a sense, it's fair enough. I understand if the New York Times isn't interested in a small political development. Uh, in backwater uh, Tunisia, right? Uh, in backwater Stable. Tunisia on December 17th. So you know, some guy set himself on fire. It, it's, the, the editorial decision is understandable. It's less understandable three weeks down the road when there's protests across the country. Yes, it's a small country. It's, it doesn't, you know, it's not part of any other big regional conflicts. It's, it has no troublesome borders. But uh, uh, I, I, I think that kind of phenomenon is, is the result of the fact that, A, there are fewer and fewer foreign correspondents abroad, that, that, that there, is, there seems to be less interest uh, in uh, in uh, uh, foreign reporting, and in the last decade, especially in our in our profession, uh, we've seen tremendous amounts of money being sucked by covering uh, into covering Iraq. Mm -hmm. I mean, which which was worth doing because you know, let's say in America, where American soldiers there, you had to cover it. But uh, the cost of that was really hurt reporting elsewhere. Which is why um, one of the wonderful networks that I think many uh, journalists discovered in, in this country is Global Voices, mm -hmm. which is a network that really tries to uh, capture uh, and, and give a place for the local bloggers. And they were covering you know, what was happening in Tunisia. The story of the impact of the Global Voices Network on the rise of this new venue of information has not been told yet fully. Because I referenced earlier the Arab Bloggers Conference in 2009 that took place in Beirut. If you look now at the, just compare the people who were present, and just take Andy's source of list, uh, list of sources, and compare it to the other journalists, you'll see that a lot of people who were there had, were basically nods. Uh, informational nods in their uh, in their milieus, and they aligned on Tunisia. They started popping up. They aligned on Egypt, and also they did align on Morocco and Bahrain. And I think that w uh, if one would uh, uh, would want to really look back, you know, back and sort of try to understand fully uh, what happened there, is that you had this global network that had established credibility by the virtue of the professionalism of its editors, and journalists came to, uh, to get used to going to Global Voices, Andrea, seeing the content, <laughs> and then... Mm -hmm. well, global Voices mm -hmm. was very much a kernel for the work I've been doing for the last five, six years. Uh, you know, before, when I was doing online disaster response, the first disaster we really responded to at an international level was the Boxing Bay tsunami. And almost all the volunteers that came together for that were through Global Voices. And then when I mentioned before that when I, I started with a small number of sources on the ground that I already knew in Tunisia, Asia and in Egypt, almost every single one of those people, those six or seven people total, I met through Global Voices five or six years ago. And just so everyone knows, uh, Global Voices, you should follow them on Twitter, and uh, they started right here in, in Cambridge. It was Rebecca McKinnon and Ethan Zuckerman who were then at the Berkman Center, and there had been a conference of bloggers from all over the world, and they said, geez, why don't we create a platform? So to, to to give all of these voices a place um, to, to, to tell their stories. Uh, more questions from the audience. Wave wildly. Yes. Uh, I was interested in finding out um, what these journalists feel about the future of the region based on these uprisings and uh, whether th they think that maybe they'll go more toward democracy or whether the Muslim Brotherhood or more fanatic Islamic movements might take over and change the nature of things. I will actually jump on that in, in 30 seconds, sort of nip it in the bud. Um, 
Our friend Sultan Qasmi said something the other day that was really interesting to hear. Uh, he said that anyone who does not recognize the reality that uh, the people in the region's interests are no longer going to be subordinated to someone else's interests to totally miss the point about what just happened. Uh, the last 15 seconds of that statement, I'll add my own, which is um, whether we like it or not, um, the, the region now has a very young population that feels empowered. So we, we quote unquote, as outsiders, need to learn to manage our anxieties and also manage our biases about the region and always subordinate them to what the, the people who live there feel is their best interest. In plain, in other words, even though I'm not a fan of the Muslim Brotherhood, spent much of my life fighting uh, their ideology, but nonetheless, as long as they don't carry a gun, we can actually avoid the disaster of the, the Algiers syndrome in the 90s that led to a quarter million dead because the generals capitalized on Western anxieties about Islamists. That doesn't mean that Islamists are the best solution uh, in the world, but um, the times have changed. We're in the 21st century, and instead of seeing an opportunity, and I say this very bluntly, uh, there hasn't been a better time than today than break, break their backs, ideologically speaking, precisely through democratic processes. I'm sure Isander here has uh, a counterpoint or two to that. Uh, no, no, I mean, I, I largely agree with what you said is that these people exist, they're a political reality. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm Moroccan American myself, and there's equivalent Islamist movements in, in, in Morocco that have been repressed, have a bunch of them do get thrown in prison regularly. And, and even though I disagree with what they believe in, I, I don't agree with that. Just like, you know, as an American, I don't like the Tea Party. I don't think that Michelle Bachmann and Rick Perry should be thrown in jail. It's, it, 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 it's, it's really, I mean, for me, the, 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 the question, you know, the, this approach to the region is, uh, oh no, there's dangerous people. These dangerous people are going to threaten all sorts of things. Yes, there is a risk. But we have to, you know, we, we, we have to, 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 to take, uh, take hold of that risk. We, we, we have to, to control that risk through democratic means, not uh, rely on, on uh, uh, you know, you know w w what was famously said, I think, by, uh, I can't remember whether it was Harry Kissinger or someone like that, about one of these dictators is, is a son of a bitch, but he's our son of a bitch. We can't, I think and, that... And also realize that uh, this is not 1979. We're yeah. not Iran. This, there's no Ayatollah Khomeini here. And, the, and these societies have evolved have beyond the point to where they may have 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 valued the safety of dictatorship, the stability of dictatorship over what you get in the long term with, with dictatorship is stagnation, which Egypt is, is really a, a, a magnificent example, I think, of the, is that Egypt will now have a very tough road ahead in the next couple of decades to recover from its long experience of a dictatorship, you know, if it makes it even. And I, we have time for one last question from the audience and, what, and a Twitter question. Can we take a, a question from Twitter? Um, question from Davin Hutchins, a.k.a. at VOA Hutch. Um, his question is, how can social media organizing be sustained once a dictator falls? Seems transitions are being co-opted by establishment. Actually, I think I, think I have a, a slight answer for that. I think that... Um, once the dictatorships in the region fall, the ones that have, one of the most interesting things that we see are both sides of the fight, those pro, those against, emerging and sort of realizing that you cannot campaign or push your ideology strictly by being on the ground, nor can you do it strictly by being online. One of the most emerging patterns in Egypt is the number of pro Hosni Mubarak groups that have emerged since the fall of, of Hosni Mubarak. And as much of an insanity as it seems to me, um, they do exist and it's, it's really important for them to actually feel that they can say something. Because once they can say it, we say, aha, but you couldn't say that under Hasni Mubarak. So we can actually use it against them. But, um, but it, you're going to see this pattern emerging and people are going to be using it a lot more to, um, to sort of experiment with democracy. And we've seen in Syria with the Syrian electronic army with all of the Syria different is the tactics. It's a very, yes, yes, Because yes. the number of users anyway yes. to begin with is very small. It's very There's small, yes. Massive censorship. And, and that's like one thing we didn't get a chance to, to talk about is that in each country it's so different. Of course, in Libya, because internet 
access is so limited, these tools did not um, play the same role. Um, I think that we're, that we're out of time. Um, I think a few of us will, will be here afterwards, if anyone, for a few minutes, although Andy for yeah, has to catch a plane. Yeah, but it's, um, it's not taking off right now. <laughs> so, uh, so please come and uh, say hello. Thank you. Mm -hmm.